Good evening, Robert Scribbler, and welcome to my most recent episode of my ongoing climate fantasy series, Helki. And this particular episode is entitled A Mirror Spectre on the Beach of Infernia. But before I get into reading this episode, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the setting. You see, Myra enters hell in this episode, so I thought it would be worthwhile to give you an, a little bit of an idea about the nature of the cosmology of Myra's world. And this cosmology exists in what I call the Arisen Worlds setting. The, and this includes both Earth, Heaven, and Hell locked in a kind of uh, discordant, conflicted relationship. Now, these worlds, main themes of these worlds involve what I call WISP, which is spirit, and the fact that hell is a world that, that failed to adequately deal with its existential crisis and ended up going on a path toward self-destruction, and so is now reliant upon wisps, uh, spirits from the earth in order to survive and continue, and has uh, its, its ruler Asmodeus has constructed all kinds of exploitative and slave type relationships involving the use of wisps, which devils capture and consume or use as fuel, and they also use it as a form of semi-invisible currency, much like stock trades or bitcoins in our world. And but, but hell itself could not exist without this outside source of uh, outside resource. Um, and, and so th this world is, is completely unsustainable. The heaven is, is a bit the opposite. I'm not going to talk too much about heaven for this episode, but uh, whereas hell has received the wisps from the nefarious, the malign, the ill-intending, uh, the insane over millennia, over eons, heaven has received the, the wisps of the dead from earth that were more benevolent and became incarnate as heroes and, and as those that helped the world of heaven, which is now a multi-world system, advance and come into balance and, and to become a riot of life and vitality. Now, if you want to learn more about the Arisen World setting, uh, I've written a blog about it over on my uh, Scribbler's Workshop page. It's fantasy, uh, fanta Scribbler's Fantastical Workshop WordPress.com. And I'll go ahead and leave a link for you guys there. Now, specifically dealing with hell, because Myra enters the hell gate in Furza Bank HQ and transports herself into hell. And she arrives in the equatorial region of hell known as Infernian. And here I have constructed an original world map of hell. This doesn't involve a lot of detail like mountain ranges or you know, specific surface details. What you see here is the main continent, which is, is a supercontinent, a lot like Pangea uh, in, in geological uh, lock. And its surrounding world ocean, which is is a, is a pretty nasty ocean full of algae and bacteria and that, that belches poisonous gas into the air. It's not a, a nice ocean like Earth's ocean. And, and for those of you who have followed my climate blogs, the world of hell is, is, is a shades worse than the Permian extinction hot, hot house Earth. So this is a very bad state environmentally. And this is due to a combination of factors, one being that there's a lot of geological activity on hell, and there's a caldera that has pushed up through uh, fossil fuel reserves, through coal and uh, uh, tar pits. 
but the devils themselves uh, burn fossil fuels mercil mercilessly and, and do not care about the consequences instead. Leaping toward quick fixes uh, to their, their situation, and, and you'll learn more about that as the, the story goes on. But, but hell itself is completely un unsustainable now without the outside resource of the souls from Earth, or WISPs which they use for all sorts of things to in, to enhance fuel, to, to fuel their infernal magics, to serve as a kind of uh, invisible currency, and, uh, and to serve as food sometimes, as a kind of hypercharged, high energy kind of uh, food that, that, that grants them extra endurance and, and, and energy and, and power. So, so hell itself could not exist now without its, its predatory relationship to Earth. Coming into hell, Myra enters a region called Eastern Infernia and a location that, that she thinks of as hell, Hell's Beach. The denizens of hell may call it something else, but right now in her mind, she's thinking of it as Hell's Beach, and I've created a, a, a zoom-in map here and a more detailed map of the specific location of the Hellgate that she arrives through. And she comes in a into Hell, in, in which it's experiencing a a number of environmental type events that are are typical to, to Hell, but uh, very difficult for Myra to deal with. So, so that's a, a brief explainer for this episode, and I'll just go, a, go ahead and start reading it for you now. Helki 7, A Mirror Specter on the Beach of Infernia. I'm lying on the ground staring up at a putrid green sky, trying to fracking breathe. The rotten egg's stench is overwhelming. A hot wind blows over some nearby sand dunes. It's pretty damn strong, blasting hot sand over my skin which is quickly making it raw. This wind is carrying the stench I'm smelling, no relief from the heat either, like air blowing out of a furnace. I lever myself up onto wobbly legs. I look over my shoulder. The hellgate I came from is gone. I stare around. Nothing but sand dunes and gnarly scrub plants that look like twisted fingers sprouting serrated blade-shaped yellow leaves. Some of the lower areas are damp and filled with green and purplish mud. The wind churning over the dunes makes a hollow wailing sound. It's so crazy hot I'm already dripping sweat. Thank gods I'm wearing my combat boots, otherwise my feet would be scorched five times over. There is a sound of a ringing bell. It's weird, out of place. I look around. There is no fracking bell tower, just dunes. There's mean-ass plants and... My searching eyes alight on a freaking skeleton on the backside of one of the dunes. It's of some long reptilian creature with wicked looking jaws. So fracking great. The bell rings again. Now I realize it's familiar, reminding me of Beatrice. Then I remember. I heard the same sound when mom touched my forehead back at Starbucks. The displaced bell rings three more times telling me that the time is 7 o frigging clock. Like I need a timepiece in hell. Well, scratch that, maybe I do. When the bell stops ringing, an apparition appears in the air in front of me. Now, it's not Princess Leia, it's me. I mean, the spinning image of me in the mirror in the damn morning in a nice safe bathroom in not hell, but on normal good old earth. Well, not literally in the bathroom mirror, a floating image of only me with no background. Just what I look like right after I've had a shower, all nicely dressed and clean. Except this me is the one before my current haircut. The hair is longer and tied back into a ponytail. It still has the red streaks, so the spitting image of me from like two weeks ago. Hey, Myra, the apparition says. I'm the mirror specter you made before you took up this crazy-ass quest. So it's a quest now, is it? Sam blows around the image as clouds begin to cross the merciless sun. 
I hardly feel any cooler, like that mean sun knows where I am and can shoot beams at me even through the clouds. My left hand is dropping sparks, well, like a handheld sparkler. So I figure the mirror specter was set up through my name curse, probably activated when Beatrice sent me through the Hellgate. Pretty nifty, really. I didn't know those specters were used for anything other than magical librarians. I gotta say, my mirror specter is way cooler than those stuffy things. The specter, me, is still talking. Since I'm here, it means you are fracking there. The mirror specter looks around. I mean, we are there. I mean, here. Gods, I can't imagine what you're thinking now. Hey, don't rub it in. I cough the words more than talk them. The air here is vicious, some kind of poison in it, too much sulfur. I need to get away from it somehow. My mirror specter looks at me in sympathy. She reaches out to grab my shoulder and then seems to realize she's insubstantial, just a ghost. Yeah, not a hologram, but a ghost me with a little bit of me in it. A little piece of my soul sent to ride shotgun with me for brief periods down here in hell. Brief because the magic that keeps it going costs, and my wisp can only recharge so much each day. But still, a little is better than nada. It makes me feel a tiny bit less isolated, just a tiny bit. I'm here to help and you should listen because I have like maybe a minute left today. The specter looks around. You're on a hell's beach, that's bad. And it looks like a storm is coming, that's worse. You need to get off this freaking beach. The air near the water is usually poisonous here, Clue. Water in hell usually equals poison air, so you need to avoid most sur surface water. She looks at my pocket. We have water? I nod in reply and pull the Perrier bottle out halfway to show it to my specter. This is really fracking weird. How did I suddenly become a freaking drill sergeant? Good, now pay attention. You will need to extend that water as far as you can with the Duplicy Exemplari curse. You know, the Jesus curse? It was an old joke. I always called Duplicy the freaking Jesus curse because you could literally break bread almost endlessly with it. It gave you like times 500 the original material. I guess I'll be drinking Perrier mineral water the whole time. The mirror me has read my mind. It might last you a freaking month, but don't spare. You need to drink constantly here. It is too freaking hot. Drink while I'm talking, for God's sake. I pick up my Perrier, chug out Duplicy Exemplari, and chug down some of the still slightly cool sparkling water. It makes me feel better, a little. Now, for part two, you're going to need to get off this beach and find some shelter quick. Storms here are God's awful beasties. She looks around. I can see where she's looking. There's a sand cliff leading to rocky high ground about half a mile away. The rocks contain crevices and outcroppings. Mirror me points to the rocks. Go to that and find shelter. It should be high enough. Get to the lee side and go as deep into a rock crevice as you can. Watch out for original owners. Gotta go. And with that, she is blown away in the sandy wind. I feel really weird. Like I just lost my best friend. The wind is picking up now and that sand hurts. But despite my specter's warning, I'm curious about what she, what she said. Hell's Beach? That means there's an ocean nearby? Probably on the other side of those dunes not far from here. Duplicy has refilled my Perrier. I take another swig. I really am curious to see this Hell's Beach. Screw it, I'm going. I trudge toward the dunes. As I get closer, the air grows ever more putrid. I decide to hold my breath. It's not easy. What air I keep in my lungs burns. I scramble over a rise and look out. Before me is a raging ocean filled with massive waves thrashing in green and purple slime. I can see pink gas rising off wave crests atop the churning toxic soup posing as actual water. Bacteria or algae material that looks like rotting flesh is piling up on shore. The foam over top of it looks like vomit. Skeletons and decaying corpses litter the beach as far as the eye can see. 
They probably succumbed to the poison air. They are close to the waterline. I realize the risk I'm taking is stupid. Yet I somehow feel so alive in this deadly place as I stand on my bone-cluttered dune. Out over that death sea is an advancing green-black wall cloud. Beneath it, the ocean looks like an explosion of water and foam rising above the regular water level. I'm reminded of a film I've seen about that Indonesian tsunami, even though this far off tidal wave like thing is being driven by a storm. The cloud is maybe 20 miles off and moving fast. Well, I saw it. I'm a goddamn hell's tourist. Now time to get the fuck out before that storm rolls in. I run down behind the dune, still holding my breath. I take about 20 paces before I choke in some more air. It's terrible, nasty, makes my nose run and eyes water in all kinds of bad ways. The wind is carrying the ocean toxin inland. My next breath is ever so slightly better, but it's still bad. I'm running on toward the rocks, my mirror pointed out. Pretty smart, really. Without me, I'd be a goner. I may still be a goner. My feet pound the ground as my lungs scream at me. I have to breathe and it hurts to breathe. It's a freaking hell version of Catch-22. The exertion is insane as I'm choking on air and running. Behind me, the ocean is starting to growl. It's the growl of the storm sucking water over rocks, sand, and bodies. Over it all, I can hear a strange and wicked howl coming from the direction of the hell gate. Now, what was that? Maybe the gate is still partly open? But what could have made that noise? I can't stop to think too much as I race toward the rocks, but I'm wondering if something happened to Beatrice and Maury back there. I did leave them with three freaking pride eater demons and Ivan fucking Volkov. Not your run of the mill polite evening company. Not my problem, I think to myself, but I'm worried. The howl carries on for a few more seconds. It seems to travel onward into the wasteland around me. It's loud, even over the storm. At last, it grows quiet. I'm still running full tilt. I can breathe a bit better now, which is a godsend because I was really starting to run out of air. Good thing I don't have asthma. I'd be done in for sure. The little weirdo plants are like razor mines. One leaf slashes a small hole in my jeans. Now I'm swerving to avoid them. If I trip and face plant into one, I'm probably dead. Who knows if they're poisonous? Why not? The air and water are great. Behind me, the storm is rapidly growing larger. It is big and green and black and mean, a towering wall stretching out over all the ocean as far as I can see. The rotten tsunami wave be below it has gotten close enough that I can guess its height, probably about 30 feet. It's terrifying, but I'm gaining altitude as rising land has given me a much safer view of the beach. I should have thought of that before I almost killed myself on that poison shore. Hell's sun is now completely gone, swallowed up in a big white, gray, and green cloud top like 15 miles up. The wind is pelting hard. It beats at me in gusts. Grit riding on it hits me like sand powder. If the wind gets too much stronger, it'll start to rip through my clothes and flesh. Seriously, no freaking joke. Fat ass raindrops are starting to fall around me. At least these are cooler, maybe just a little, loop cool. They pelt me intermittently, bringing with them slight relief. My hair and back are a plaster of wet sand. Legs are starting to burn now. Running in hell over sand uphill while breathing sulfurous air is no joke even for someone who prides herself on staying in decent shape. The strong wind pushing from behind is a help to speed me along, though. At last, my feet touch rocky ground. Before me, the outcropping rises up. It's like lots of fingers of some kind of hard rock clawing out of the sand to poke at the sky. They make crevices and canyons between them. They're also part of a land rise, perhaps 100 feet above the shoreline. I don't even turn around to look back. The wind and sand are now too brutal. I dive into one of those pathways in the rock, make as many little turns as I can to get some shelter from the wind and grit whipping through. I cross between three separate walls of rock and make my way to a shelter in a hollow beneath an overhang before I feel safe. 
It's not really a cave, but a cleft that cuts about 10 feet into one of the bigger rocks. There are cracks and crevices that run deeper, but my mirror's warning about original owners makes me wary of trying to go too far in. Cooler air wafts out from the holes. It also smells cleaner. I put my back to stone, slide myself down to a semi-comfortable sitting position, pull out my almost endless decanter of Perrier water, take a big gulp and watch the storm rage just outside. I can't see too much because I picked a pretty protected spot, relatively high up and wrapped in by a crescent of large stone formations. What I can see is terrifying enough. It gets dark as night outside. Sand and water are hurled around by what must be tornado strength winds. The material is all blowing away from me and I'm sheltered by many walls. So I'm basically safe. I don't feel safe. I know if I step outside, I'm going to be picked up like a rag doll and ripped apart by sand razor wind in moments. Water coming down in that roaring mess is more than torrential. I'm quickly drenched as it pours and pools in my cleft. Thank goodness I picked a higher place, otherwise I'd probably be swimming. This rainwater seems kinder than the ocean water. I tentatively taste it. It's still sulfurous and probably not safe to drink. I stick to my Perrier bottle. Despite the storm's outrageous jet plane roar of noise, I'm getting tired. The water falling in is cool enough to be comforting. The air coming out from the caves is kind. It lulls me. Hell, I'm pretty damn tired. It's been a long ass day, all with drinking the memory draw, sneaking into Furza Bank, falling through a Hellgate, landing on Hell's Beach, breathing poison air while having to run a race through razor sharp plants against the mother of all storms. I look at my name curse. It's still got a decent amount of magic left. My wisp is pretty strong and my parents did their best to use their own magic to get me into Furza Bank. All I've done so far is open a Hellgate, summon my mirror specter, and turn my Perrier bottle into an endless refills fountain beverage. All, ha, that's actually a lot, but I've got a handful of minor curses or a couple more major ones left to me. A permanent Ignaris curse is already running on my name curse as a magical tattoo. It doesn't always work, but it prevents most mundanes and non-magically sensitive types from seeing the color changes in it when I use it. It also makes the sparks less obvious to them. Although, as you remember from the Pride Eaters, it's, no, it's not foolproof. I decide to feed a bit more curse energy into my tattoos, Ignaris, and extend it to my body. I need to rest, but I need to do it with some assurance of safety. I haven't yet met any of Hell's live inhabitants, but I don't want to press my luck. The dead things on the beach didn't look friendly at all. What should I expect? I'm literally in fracking hell. Ignaris and Plio, I chant quietly, focusing my energy on the already active curse magic. A couple of stray sparks fall from my tattoo. I feel the curse widen like an electric field. There is a kind of snap and crackle as Ignaris envelops me. It's not perfect, but the girl who just spent the day breaking into hell and surviving her first freaking encounter with it has got to sleep. As satisfied as I'm going to be, I close my eyes and allow myself to drift off. Sleep comes quick, bringing with it more of those damn ringing bells. As I drift off, I again feel a sense of duplicity, of occupying two places at once. In one, there is hard rock, roaring wind, and lashing water. In the other, there is a sense of floating and sensory deprivation. The combination makes it oddly easier to drift off into deeper sleep. And that concludes chapter seven of Helki. Thank you for joining me. If you are interested more in reading or if you wish to read this chapter, you can do so at Scribbler's Fantastical Workshop.wordpress.com. I'll go ahead and leave some links. There's also more Helki lore being added to the site by the day. And uh, for the next chapter, chapter eight, we are going to stay in hell with Myra. And I'm going to provide an, uh, a follow-on blog before I do a video blog that explains a little bit more about her name curse and, and some of my inspirations for that and some 
notions for how that works for you. So thank you all for joining me and I'll look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.